Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Benjamin Elder, and this is Antonio Ojea. We're both senior software engineers at Google, and our talk is on Keep Calm and Load Balance with Kind. So what is Kind? Kind is Kubernetes and Docker. Um, it's a tool that we built for testing the Kubernetes project initially. Um, it uses Docker containers to simulate nodes so you can run them locally. And it can build and run Kubernetes from source as long as, as well as some pre-built images. It boots a cluster in 30 seconds because everything is packed into the container and running locally. Um, this was really important for us for the Kubernetes project to have very cheap, fast, local testing because we need to test changes to Kubernetes constantly. It's minimal but fully conformant. Once something is simple and streamlined uh, and flexible. It has multi-node support, which is required to actually run all of the conformance tests properly because there's some tests around rolling node behavior. And it has persistent volume support. Everything else comes from Kubernetes core itself. And the rest is just getting those to run. We have a very, very minimal lightweight networking agent called KindNetD. It just ensures that pods are routable between nodes with the minimal simplest CNI. There's no load balancer and no ingress. We have bring your own and some docs for that. So that's where the project is coming from. It looks a little bit like this. So you've got Docker running on your host. Within each Docker container for the node, we have systemd because we need an init process for Kubernetes. Uh, we're running containerd. And we have a bunch of images for all the Kubernetes project and the binaries. We run kubelet and our kindnet pod and everything else is standard Kubernetes. So you have some Cordianus pods, kube proxy, kube controller manager, etcd, kube API server, and your user workloads. And these are in nested containers. Um, if you're familiar with Docker and Docker, it's the same idea. In Kubernetes CI, we actually run on Kubernetes. So we wind up with um, containerd and Docker in containerd. It's, it's, it, it works. I, I, I don't recommend it, but it, it solved our problems. So as I said, it supports a multi-node, which looks something like this, spread across. If you have a single node, we'll just untaint the node, and you can run your workloads there. And for most application testing, that's what's appropriate. But for testing Kubernetes, we really need to test behavior across nodes. So it looks like a pretty standard Kubeatom cluster. It's powered by Kubeatom. You've got a control plane node, and you've got some worker nodes, standard Kubernetes. For networking, we have some really simple stuff, as I said. It's a Docker bridge network, and we're using uh, V8 pairs with very simple standard CNI plugins, and then just a small agent that handles some things like IP masquerade that are necessary to get traffic working in and out of these nodes. Um, you can see the IP tables fire here. Uh, if you've ever worked with IP tables containerized, <laughs> You'll know what we're talking about. Um, when you run IP tables, the API is some user space binaries. There's not really a kernel API you're supposed to use, but it kind of needs to match. And over time, it's actually moved away from being backed by IP tables to being backed by NF tables. And uh, you really need that to match what's happening on your host. So we have a little bit of magic in the entry point um, code developed with the core Kubernetes project to detect which one is in use and switch to the right one and try to match three layers down from your host to the kind node to the cube proxy running inside the kind node. A little bit of a fire, but it works. Pretty simple for the most part. So since 2019, um, Antonio, my co-maintainer, and I have been talking about we should really have an actual load balancer implementation so we can test these other things. Like we started with the conformance test that got us a lot of great coverage. But there's a lot of other fun Kubernetes functionality that people want to be able to develop and test. And load balancer was a pretty obvious gap. And I'm going to hand off to Antonio to talk some more about what we did there. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. OK, let me. Well, as Ben said, uh, kind become more and more popular, and, and Kubernetes become more and more, and more complex, right? I'm TL in Sync Network, too, so I use kind a lot. And as you may know, when you create a service, you can have a service type load balancer. But what's the problem with this? The problem is that for 
being able to test it or to just to use it for kind users, we, we don't even have a good solution, right? So uh, we needed a controller and something that, that uh, creates this load balancer that configure this external IP and that make this accessible from, from outside the kind cluster. We have a, a good solution and temporal solution that is Metal Ray, but the problem with Metal B is that it has several gaps. Right? One is that it uses, uh, if we go to the technical part, it uses our L2 or L3 to be able to expose the virtual IP for the load balancer, right? And this has a hard dependency on the Linux bridge. So users need to use Linux to be able to use that. And the other problem is that you don't have a lot of the features that the cloud providers load balancer have. So when we were developing in in SIG Network, this kept the 90, the 16, 1669 terminating in points, I started to struggle with how are we going to test this? Because the main point of this uh, feature is to user to be able to have um, rolling updates with zero, zero disruption, right? So this is a very tricky feature to test with a lot of timing, uh, a lot of race conditions and with multiple moving parts. This, this feature is based on, on, if you understand how the pod life cycle works, you know that the pod has several states, right? The pod starts running, but the pod is not ready. The readiness of the pod is what indicates when uh, the pod must be used as an endpoint of the service. That means that it's signaling every network infrastructure that say, okay, this pod is ready to receive traffic. Because until this cap, the how can I say it? the the until this cap, the endpoints were binary, so or the pod can be ready or not ready. But the problem with this is that when one pod was terminating, it is still be able to share traffic until the new pod is coming, right? So we need to add a new condition to the pod. That is the pod serving and terminating, right? And this allows to implement terminating endpoints. The way that this works is, is, is a bit complex. This is kind of a diagram and explaining everything. So you have a pod, the pod starts running, the status of the pod is published by the kubelet in the API server, right? The, there is another controller, the point slice controller, that runs in the queue controller manager. This controller is watching for the pods continually. So when you configure a server, you have a selector to select all the pods. And this controller is starting to watch, okay? The pod is ready, okay? You can send traffic to this pod. When the pod is terminating, before this cap, the pod was removed from the endpoints. What does it mean? That the pod is still able to share traffic. There is going to be a gap between the pod is terminating until the new pod is running, where the, pod is, the traffic can be black hole. So, to be able to implement, in this di diagram, so to be able to solve this problem, you need to coordinate different components, right? One is, and the more important component here is the external load balancer. The way that it works is with uh, the health checks of the load balancer. If you see this diagram, you have a typical high, avail high availability deployment, right? You have your deployment and you deploy one instance in each zone, right? The load balancer is health checking the, the pods, it's, it's health checking the service health check node port to see the health of the pod and it's sending traffic, traffic to the one that are available. So, so far so good. When you are doing a rolling update, usually let's go to the simple model that you say, okay, I'm going to make only one and available at a time. So then the pod start terminating, right? But meanwhile, the pod is start terminating, the load balancer need to detect, oh, this pod is still not ready. So the health check has to still be failing, but traffic has to still go into this, this pod to, to be serving this, to fix this race, right? Think that at the T0, the pod start terminating, but the load balancer is not going to notice that it's unavailable until the health check fails. 
So this is the key of the feature and the complexity, and that's why we need to develop this solution, because doing this with a load balancer in a cloud provider is a need to test that can run for minutes and is very racy. Once the new pod starts running, the health check starts to be serving again, it starts to be green again, and the load balancer keeps sending traffic to it. So this was the, the main motivation, right? There are, as you see, there were a lot of issues open during the time, but we never had this strong use case to invest time on this. And what we decided to do is, okay, we want to test cloud providers. We want to, and also the, our users like the cloud provider experience because it's more real. They, didn't, they don't need to do workarounds with the port mapping, with the redirecting and all the stuff. So let's try to build this cloud provider kind. And what the cloud provider kind is, is doing is just mimicking the operation of, of a normal cloud provider, right? So it detects the service. When it detects that it needs a load balancer, it spawns a new load balancer. The implementation right now is an HI proxy container that runs in the same Docker network. So when you create this container, it has an IP from the Docker network, so the, the users can use this IP to, to connect to the load balance. The other important feature that we wanted to implement is just thinking in the future, right? Is let's see if we cover more use cases for, for load balancer and maybe multi-cluster, right? So we decided to keep iterating on this idea of, okay, let's try to do our own cloud provider. And what we implemented is an out of three, an, a component that runs out of the cluster that is able to handle multiple cluster at the same time. In the future, this can be used for implementing global load balancer, for example, or I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of uh, ideas that we want to hear from all of you. The people that have ideas, please come to us and talk about what are your use cases and we, we, we think about how to implement them. So I prepared a demo. I mean, this is super, uh, okay, let me find it. Okay. I prepared a, a demo, a demo for showing all this complexity. Let's see. So you create, I create the, the kind cluster already. So kind get clusters. So you have a kind cluster with three nodes, okay? Let's see that I didn't have any left over. So this is empty. This is empty, okay? So what you usually do, I have the, this deployment, let me, is the screen good enough or should I zoom? Make it bigger, okay. So you can go to the repo and you have these examples on how to use it. You can see I have a deployment, right? This is typical deployment that you should use for a serial and tan. If you are worried about availability and you want to roll out applications in with serial and tan, you need to, to think in using this uh, features for your deployment, right? So important things that we have here. We want to define the rolling update uh, strategy, right? So you define the maximum number that you want to be unavailable. It's just in that you have a problem or something, you don't want to roll all of them at the same time. Another important piece here is the termination grace period seconds. What this is doing is that when the pod is terminating the queuelet is still going to give him like 30 minutes to finish to doing things. In this case, what we want is, okay, you are terminating, stay, stay, start to gracefully terminate the TCP connection. Just don't break all of them. Another important thing is we want to have some anti-affinity. I mean, there are different options to implement that, but ideally you want all your replicas to land in different nodes, right? Because you can hide availability. If you put the pods in the same node, this is going to be a single point of failure. And your application needs to be able to handle this termination uh, period, right? So it's, uh, you are going to receive a sick term. At that time, you need to start to do the cleanup. So it's important. This is not magic. 
Uh, there are multiple components working here, and your application needs to be aware of this and play well with them. The, another important piece is that you need to, to define the external traffic policy to local. This is important. If you know when you have external traffic policy, you can have two external traffic policies, right? It can be local or cluster. When you have cluster, the load balancer will send the traffic to any node in the cluster, and then when it reaches one node, the queue proxy, whatever service implementation you have, is going to bounce it back to any node in the cluster. So you have two problems because of this. One is performance, because you are doing a double hop on the node, and the other problem is that you are going to lose your precious source IP. You are going to see the node IP. That's something that most people don't like, especially if you need to be want to have some sort of telemetry on your application about who is using your application. Okay. So far, so good. Let's apply this load balancer deployment. Okay, what I did wrong. Ah, death. <laughs> okay. A bit nervous today, sorry. It's good. I think, okay. So now we are going to see. Now, I don't know. There has, it's going to be a problem. Let's see who is spotted first. So we have the pods running. I will have the service. So you see the problem, right? How do I reach this service? I mean, I have my application, but I'm not able to reach the cluster IP. I'm outside of the cluster. I need to reach. And this is when cloud provider kind comes to help us. So this, as I say, this is a binary that runs outside of the cluster. Let's put some verbosity, right? And everything happened too fast, but I'm going to fast forward and explain to you what happened. So it detects all the nodes. It detects that there is a service. It detects that the service is external traffic policy local and that there is a load balancer. And what it does is, OK, I'm going to configure, create a lo uh, load balancer. Let's see here. That's this container, right? HA proxy, whatever. We can use another thing, but this was handy because we already had this image. And then I'm, I'm going to configure this HA proxy to be able to connect to this. Important, thing th important things here, the health check. That's why I said before, we have the Met MetalLB. Why you don't use MetalLB? MetalLB is a three or a two load balancer. It gets the IP or nothing else. With this, we have this granularity. We can co configure health checks. We can define a different port for the health check because you know when you have a service load balancer with external traffic policy local, the system already provides you with a, uh, what's the name? A node port, health check, a health check node port. That's a special node port that is able to answer how many endpoints are alive in that node. Right? And this is what the load balancer is going to use to detect if it should send traffic to that node or not. Okay, so now we should have the IP. Um, you see, we have the IP. One, So, and let's see, now we are going to inspect the container of the J proxy, and this has too much. And you see, so basically, it's how, I mean, it's oversimplifying, but it's, it's most, more or less the techniques that the cloud providers use to, to provide your load balancer when you are in the cloud, right? But it's, okay, now let me clear this. So we have the pods. We see that we have a different pod in different nodes. Those are the names. Let me get the IP. And we are going to query the IP. 192.168.3. And then ask, who are you? I need to do the code thing because of the way. OK. This is VK 
key WSW, that is this one. And if I keep querying, I got the other one, right? So the load balance is working. That is great, right? And what you're saying, I can do that with uh, metal beer, right? You can do that, of course. The problem is, as I say, I was super worried about this terminating endpoint features and I needed this well tested because it's critical. We are talking about people that is worried about losing one or two packets, so this has to work like a clock. So what we are going to do, we are going to emulate exactly the same behavior that the people that want zero downtime want. So well, let's emulate a basic client holding the load balancer okay I don't know what it is ah do okay now you need to trust me a bit, but you see that things change, right? <laughs> so basically, it's, every time it's hitting one of them. So what we need to do, so this is the scenario, right? We are pulling the load balancer. Uh, ideally, this is spreading the load equally, so 50% of each request should go to one load balancer, but now is the key is, okay, I have a new version of my application, right? Get deployment. And zero up so and now let me find the container image name it's one of these places okay so my application is 2.39 and now I have a new version that is 2.40 and I want to roll out my new versions without any disruption so how do I do that well I don't remember the command exactly, so I'm going to go to the history image. Okay, you see? So basically what I'm saying is update this deployment to upgrade my image to 2.40. And let's see what starts to happen here, right? So when we see here, get pods. You see, okay, there is a pod pending and another pod terminating, right? I have a grace period of 30 seconds, so at this point, you see the load balancer detected, oh, the one application is terminating, so let's go only to the one that is available, right? It keeps terminating, it keeps the stuff that they need to do, but I keep sending the traffic to the only one that is alive. So when we reach the 30 seconds, we should start to see the point, okay? You see this new application, the 2.30, start to be created, and both start to receive the traffic, right? So everything is good, the load balancer detect, everything is good, and now, again, this start to be terminated and all the traffic is switching to the, to the good, let's say, the good version. If we can keep looking after some seconds, when all the rollout is complete, everything has terminated and the new application is running, now, don't fail me, okay, you, here you go. You have everything working. <laughs> and, well, this is uh, one of the main motivations. The other one that we want to keep developing is hear more ideas. We know that people from Mac and Windows want to use load balancer. Just know that we have you in our minds, but it's much more complex than, you know, and we will try to solve that problem. Uh, I don't know. I think that's it. Do you have any questions? The slides. Okay. Well, if you have questions, there's a mic here. Thanks for the talk. Um, I just want to go back to the, the program you started that created the load balancer. How does it? Oh, do you want the code? Guide me. Do you want to see this? Yeah, exactly. So 
I guess it's talking to the local DNS to grab an IP. So it's another new IP from the local network going on the host. Uh, the one ninety uh, two uh, Okay. That's from the Docker. Where, where is the IP grab from? Wait, one, one second. Let me see. So. And is, is that already open source and accessible? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. This, this, this cloud provider kind is an official Kubernetes project, right? This is now testing the CI. This is uh, when you when you use this feature, this program is testing that we don't regress. So the way that this works is this cloud provider kind has to query two API, right? It's the API of the control plane of the cluster and the API of the implementation of kind, in this case, Docker, right? So you go to the Docker and it's able to create containers. So when you create the load balancer, you create a new Docker container that is a load balancer. So this IP is from the container that you just created. So it's Docker, in this case, who is providing the IP. So the, the controller is able to glue these two things, the infrastructure provided, provided by Docker and the Kubernetes uh, services cluster. So. We've also been saying Docker this whole time, but Podman has nominal support uh, for this one, and NerdCuddle support is landing in kind, so we'll probably look at NerdCuddle support in cloud provider kind. Well, I have a pretty smart question in SM because I just want to know where the IP is coming from, so it would be nice to fire up some commands so we just could see the IP interface to which bridges you are available. Um, for example, if you see, uh, if you fire up um, kubectl get nodes minus uh, OY, so we could see which IPs the nodes get and if they differ from the node that I'm served. So we just know which network it is uh, the IP gets. Uh, it, it, it's the bridge network that the Docker nodes are running on. Okay. So the so the can, so there's containers for the the kind cluster nodes. They're running on a, on a bridge network. Okay, so it's the same bridge. It's the same bridge. Yeah, as Ben said, we we want to make this portable, right? We have uh, Podman, we have Docker, and we have now NerdCTL, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's what we are trying to do. We try to abstract the the controller from the infrastructure, right? Not to reuse this API that Docker Podman provide to us, and we just fetch this information and we use it for, for the different implementation. <laughs> Sorry, I have another question then. Uh, yes. So the, the demo is using HF proxy. Let's say I want to use something else. Is it doable or? It's very tight. Uh, yeah, it's doable. Look, it's, when I started this, I, I was having a great fun, right? So the first thing that I try is, okay, I'm going to do a super load balancer and remade myself with Golang, whatever. And this, I, when I spend two days and say, oh, this is super complex, let me try to get the HA project working and, and see. So ideally, I would love to have something more fancy, right? But this keeps the things working. And <laughs> we, we actually, uh, um, we didn't talk about Kind has some HA control plane support for testing Kubernetes. It's not very mature, but it's there enough to do some. So we already have um, in the core Kind project, we provision an HA proxy container for similar purposes. So it was just easy to start with. But uh, if there's a really strong demand, we could look at something else. It should just be an implementation detail, though. Well, talking about implementation details, um, the HProxy is configured for the backend servers. Do you use the data plane API for that, or is it uh, templated? It, it's templated. Right now it's templated, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's as we, we had HProxy historically, we just reused the things that we have. It's, it's just implementation. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for a great uh, presentation. I really like it. I have just the one question, but uh, maybe it's not to you, but anyway, I want to ask. So basically, you create a support or you create an application that uh, uh, making available to um, test uh, application or services that have uh, type load balancer. And I know uh, Kind is, uh, you, uh, does not have currently network policy support. And the uh, official documentation uh, suggests uh, to use another plugin uh, and make it work. I wanted to ask if uh, uh, there could be a solution like that because it uh, was like a plug and play 
it was more uh, easy to do it like that other than reconfigure yeah. some uh, network stuff. Yeah, like I said, when we started, we were looking for this is the set of things that you're expected every Kubernetes cluster to have. Network policy, uh, unfortunately, is not one of those things that is actually super widespread. Um, and there is no implementation in the, in the Kubernetes project. And um, I, I would say something of a little bit of a loose API. So it hasn't been a, a focus yet. The, the, OK, let, let's try to give context to this. When Kaina started to have these problems, which senior CNI are you going to use, right? And then I want to use Calico, I want to use Sirion, I want to use Runner, I want to use whatever. So then they say, OK, let's do our minimum senior CNI, and then we have an op that say disable CNI, and you can install Calico, Sirion, Runner, whatever, right? If you go to any of these CIs, they are using Kaina. So you can install Cilium, Calico, in kind and use that, right? The problem is with the features, as you say, is are we going to implement a whole network policy daemon in our CNI? I can tell you I implemented network policies in different CNIs. It's a lot of work and very complex. So what we decided is, okay, let's give the people the minimum and let's give the people that build CNIs, oh, sorry. <laughs> the opportunity to, you know, hook into our uh, project and use it so the people that want network policies, they can install the other CNIs and use it. Thank you. So, the last question because we are not. First, uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for coming. It's great. Um, I have a question. The external libraries that you launched for a, the load balancer, are you planning to actually make it available in the kind of config so that we, for a kind of cluster, like I said, we want this cluster to have a transversal API? So it's a little bit of an open question. We wanted to start as an out-of-tree project because another thing about Kind is it has extremely minimal dependency set. People embedded in their test runners, their cluster API tools, that sort of thing. If you look at the main Kind module, it imports 12 packages. <laughs> so we wanted a little bit more flexibility to iterate on this. Um, the other thing is, as Antonio mentioned, we're interested in being able to test things like multi-cluster. So now you need it to be provisioned once across them. So it kind of has a separate life cycle from the cluster. If you think about it, like it's like your cloud provider, right? You don't bring up a, a cloud every time you bring up a cluster. You have the cloud running, and then you bring up the clusters. Yeah, to be honest, I don't think I see personally the need for like multi-cluster development. Sure. Yeah, we're just trying to enable the Kubernetes projects to t to test things, and there's some multi-cluster stuff in the in the Kubernetes org. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and if you have more questions, we are going to be around. Thank you.